Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. Let's talk about your ejection and that famous photo that came out. Tell us about that, Vic. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I was uh, on a two-ship mission. Uh, I was flying with the weasel, Iron Hand mission. I Iron Hand was the code name when you go Sam hunting. Uh, so I was on an Iron Hand mission, uh, only a two-ship because it was down right above the DMZ. Uh, the, the Sams had been gradually working their way down, and uh, there was... We were hunting for three new suspected sand sites in that area. And uh, uh, so we're flying along. And as we approached the first sand site, it was under a uh, undercast for us, but it was overcast for them. And you couldn't see the ground. Well, you didn't want to go sand hunting unless you can see the ground because the best defense against the sand is it can, it can spot the launch. The launch, the is the booster is so powerful it just lights up and throws up all this dust and everything. and while, it, the, while it's in the boost phase you can see it's like a big flame come out of there so uh, it's that way you, you can defeat the missile by putting it off to its wing uh, you, you gotta force it to start coming back down and then when you can't stand it anymore you say he's as close as I want him to be you pull up and it tries to go with you and its small wings make it tumble, and that's and that's how you defeat a missile. So anyway, so because we couldn't see that one, uh, and I, I, the guys I was flying with, uh, the rest of their souls, they both have flown west since then. Uh, great, great we, uh, weasel crew. Uh, so he said, "Hey, we'll bypass this one because of the cloud cover." We went up to the second suspect. We went went feet wet, went up the coast. Uh, to the second suspected one, uh, which was at Ron's Ferry, no activity at all. Turn inland. Now we're headed for the last suspected site, which was about 30 miles inland. And as we're approaching it, um, the backseater of the, the Ewo says, okay, he says, I'm picking up an intermittent uh, uh, radar gun. He says, but he says, before I can get a lock on him, he, he goes off the air. So then we got to the, where the third suspected site was, nothing there. So the, the flight lead says, let's go back to the first one and see if the weather has cleared out. So I double clicked my radio to acknowledge that I understood what we were doing. We started this hellacious uh, or this big turn to the left to go back out to the water when I got a hellacious compressor stall. It, it was so powerful, it knocked my feet off my rudders. Wow. Now, the 100 was prone to compressor stalls. So, uh, anytime you got slow, high angle attack, it would compressor stall. You wouldn't even ride them up because uh, it was standard for a 100. 105 hardly ever compressor stall. If it compressor stall, that meant there was something wrong with the engine. Mm -hmm. So I immediately realized I had an engine problem. And when I experienced it, it just coincidentally happened that I was pointing directly towards the home plate, the home base. So I immediately rolled out, headed for it, and I really thought I got an engine problem, but I'll be able to nurse it back home. So meanwhile, <laughs> uh, when I get excited, I talk too fast. And I remember going through my head and tell Lee that you have an engine problem, but you better speak, uh, speak slow because They'll never understand you if you speak at your normal excited uh, speed, and they'll never know what happened to you. So sure enough, on the radio you can hear, because I have a recording of this, because uh, uh, the weasels always record their missions to analyze the frequencies of the SAMs and all that. So anyway, uh, my radio call goes like, we, we were Clipper. He, he was 
Clipper lead, now it's Clipper two. And the reader call went like this. Uh, uh, Clipper, uh, Clipper lead, uh, this is a, uh, this is Clipper two days after business stops. <laughs> he goes, you what? <laughs> I just had a bunch of compressor stalls. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, but unfortunately, I rolled out and he had kept on his turn. So now he rolls back. So now I'm trying to get him DF steers to hook up with me again. And the uh, 105 had a beautiful ADF function where if somebody's transmitting, you could go to the ADF function and the needle would point right to where he is. Right. So he keeps on saying, Give me ADF steers. So I'd say, okay, uh, she's still compressor stalling, you know, and uh, and he says, uh, get rid of your bombs. So uh, <laughs> I remember asking, safe or uh, or armed, and I, I think he said safe. So I think I, I dropped him in the safe position, and so then uh, as we went along, I couldn't maintain airspeed or altitude. I was on a gradual descent because I was compressor stalling so bad that. I left a trail of crumbs where the enemy could follow me because after that, I uh, got rid of the uh, mirror rack the, where you hang your bombs. Uh, then I got rid of the, the, and the first I got rid of the tanks. First thing I got rid of bombs, tanks, mirror rack, then the airplane. <laughs> so I left them a trail to find me. So anyway, so uh, uh, finally, so I finally transmitted and um I was always impressed by a good buddy of mine uh, that uh, uh, bailed out when I was leading him in a flight, uh, non-combat. This was over in Korea. And uh, what impressed me was when he went to bail out, he called hooking up his lanyard on, on his D-ring, which uh, uh, bypassed the altimeter and timer. And it would, you'd get an immediately open parachute. So you do want that hooked up on your deer ring if you're going to do a low altitude uh, bailout. So uh, I always remembered uh, that I was impressed that he had the presence of mind to call hooking up his lanyard. So sure enough, I did the same thing. I said, okay, Clipper 2, hook, hook up, uh, up his lanyard, and I'm going now. And he said, Roger, I, I remember him saying, Roger's is as good as any place. <laughs> so <laughs> so I uh, pulled the handles up. Well, we were in the midst of a modification at the time. The fleet was getting modified, and they were converting the seat from the uh, uh, shell blast that shot you out to a rocket seat, which made a much smoother ejection. Well, with the old system, when you pull the handles up, the canopy would go. You squeeze the trigger, boom, you get shot out. The new system, when you raise the handles, all it did was arm the system. Mm. Then you had to squeeze the trigger, canopy go, and you'd follow two tenths of a second later. Well, when I pulled up the handles and the canopy didn't go, I was so used to the old system because I'd flown the airplane so long under the old system that I thought, oh my gosh, the system has failed. I'm going to have to blow myself through the canopy. Mm. So here I'm trying to get the nerve to squeeze the trigger. And I know I have to do it, but I'll tell you what, there's some apprehension getting ready to bail out. Yeah. So I remember trying to get the courage to squeeze the trigger. And I'll never forget how sensitive that trigger was because it seems like when I finally did touch it, I no sooner touched it, it started squeezing it. And man, they were in the canopy and then I went out. So I was very pleasantly surprised at that. And I remember it was a nice big, uh, oh, I went out so slow. That I could, I, I remember reading the, the the instrument panel, 172 knots, which is slower than what we flew final at in the 105. <laughs> you, you fly uh, the 105 at 183, and I'm, I'm at the 172. Uh, and uh, uh, altimeter was 3,700 feet. Uh, actual above terrain was 1,700 feet. Uh, nice big uh, slow arc. Did a somersault over the top. I remember seeing my feet against the blue sky. And then as I came back around, I see this 105 go by me. And I remember cussing lead out because I thought it was him. And I thought to myself, 
Lead. I said, God damn, you don't have to get that close to me. And then I realized it wasn't lead. It was my airplane that I just left. <laughs> so, so I kept my eye on it and I watched it and it slowly started a uh, left bank turn and crashed into a mountain range about five miles away. So I saw the airplane hit and explode. And I remember thinking, boy, I'm glad I wasn't in there. Mm. So now I'm coming down the chute, very mild opening chute because I'm going out so slow. And uh, so I start preparing for a uh, tree landing because I'm coming down a very dense, dense jungle. So I uh, cross my leg to protect the family, you know what, mm-hmm. <laughs> jewels. <laughs> and uh, uh, one hand in front of the riser, the other hand behind the riser, made myself as streamlined as I could be for the tree landing. And man, I'll tell you what, when I hit that tree, it was a sudden stop. And bang, and like that. Next thing I know, I find myself hanging upside down. And what happened was my right ankle was wedged between a, a split and uh, the tree, uh, two branches, right wow. there. So I'm um, uh, up, hanging upside down. And uh, so it took me a while try, attempting to do inverted or upside down uh, sit ups to grab that, that branch. After several attempts, quite a few attempts, I finally succeeded, got on, on the branch, pulled myself up. I was tired, and all I wanted to do was get off that tree. Mm-hmm. Well, in Southeast Asia, those trees grow up to 200 feet. So guys were releasing themselves from trees, not realizing they were that high, and falling 200 feet and breaking mm-hmm. bones when they hit the ground. So they had just installed a 200-foot lanyard wound in, inside your parachute pack. So you don't put up this little panel, pull out the, uh, the, your, the, that riser, put it through the, uh, or the lanyard, put it through the risers, come back, and then hook it on to your uh, harness here and release yourself. And now you can control your descent uh, by uh, where you put the, the, the lanyard. If, you, if, you're, if you're head close to you, you're coming down fast. You want to slow down, you pull it out a little bit, you mm-hmm. know. Or it might have been vice versa. It's been so long ago since memory. So anyway, so that's what you're supposed to do. Well, I want to get off that tree so bad that I, and, and we'd only been trained in that new system once. I wasn't sure I knew how to do it correctly. So what I did is I took my helmet and I dropped it. So I try and get an idea of how high it was. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I released my helmet, it disappeared into the jungle. It was so thick. Mm. So that didn't help me any. I didn't know. So then, uh, desperation, I did something very foolish. Chancy, but, but I said, I'm going to chance it. I'm going to release myself and hope that I'm not too high. So I released myself. Plump, to my surprise, only dropped about six feet and I was on the ground. Wow. That, meant that, that, that meant that when I was hanging upside down, with my foot wedged in there, my head was only about three feet off the ground. Oh, so you're lucky there then. Yeah, very lucky there. So then we got uh, 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 down there and uh, took out the, oh, so the very first thing I did is I, uh, the backpack, parachute backpack, carried a beacon. So when a guy would bail out, it automatically would transmit, you could hear the, the beacon and you know somebody's uh, bailed out. Well, the procedure was to turn that beacon off because that beacon would interfere with your survival radio. So I opened the little panel and I turned off the beacon. So now I make contact with the, uh, uh, my lead and I keep on hearing him say, secure your beacon, secure your beacon. And I'm thinking to myself, I did. Why are you telling me that? You know? So I thought, well, I better check. So I checked and sure enough, my beacon had been packed erroneously it had been packed in the off position and still the on position. Right. So when I turn it without looking at it, I actually turn it on instead of off. <laughs> so did that, corrected that error. So then I got my hand radio and uh, it was, I submitted a redesign from my experience. What happened was 
uh, your uh, uh, mode switch for your survival radio would go from off to uh, uh, beacon. No, off, talk, beacon. So when I pushed on it, I pushed it to talk, but in my excitement with the adrenaline pumping, I pushed right through talk and went to beacon. So now he's talking to me with voice. I'm answering them with beacon, you know. And pretty soon he, the uh, guy is smart. Pretty soon he realizes what's happening. So he says, let's start over again. He says, uh, if you're reading me fine, give me one beep. Beep. Good. Understand you're reading me. Uh, if you're uh, injured, give me one beep. Well, no, if you're injured, give me two beeps. Well, I wasn't injured, so I didn't know what to do. So I thought, well, geez. So I kind of kept quiet. And he said, uh, Roger, understand you may be injured. I thought, no, you know. So anyway, we had to start over again. Make long story short, he was talking to me in voice, and I was talking to him with answering beeps and mm -hmm. beeps. So he, uh, but smart, you know, playing 20 questions. So anyway, he finally said, um, we got the search for the, on the way, uh, go off the air, conserve your radio for, uh, uh, and come back up in 15 minutes when air assets get uh, nearby. Uh, so then we, I did, uh, and then, so I'm not, so now I'm sitting and they're waiting for those 15 minutes to go by. Uh, and all of a sudden I start, I get aware of all the jungle noises and you'd be surprised the jungle noises. I mean, branches are constantly breaking, mm -hmm. falling down. There's birds uh, whistling. <laughs> and then it, it, uh, the bird behind you would answer him. He's like, oh, I'm <laughs> surrounded by the enemy, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so I, I realized I'm looking out there and even though it's a dense jungle, I realized I'm kind of out in the open. So I started heading up towards the uh, uh, mountain, the uh, karst. Uh, you, are you familiar with the term karst? Do you know what karst is? No. Karst is um, uh, mountainous uh, mountains that, that's uh, indigenous to that area, uh, almost volcanic, uh, very okay. rough, right. and, and also very porous. There's caves in there. So, so I I went about 200 yards up to this range of cars that I'd seen come down my chute and I'm thinking to myself okay I, now I'm here and I, I gotta hide and it's surprising with the adrenaline pumping how narrow vision you have so I'm thinking where can I hide well as I calm down and my vision expanded I see these cave entrances caves so, so you go in there so I went in there man a few steps into the cave dark as can be. I had to stand there a while and let my eyes get accustomed mm -hmm. to it. Then once I, I, uh, I got accustomed to it, I could see it. It was like a labyrinth. I could go straight or I could take a passage to the left or a passage to the right. Mm -hmm. So I went to the left. Typical fighter pilot, pilot pilots always turn left. So I went to the left. Uh, went uh, several feet down there. And it's really getting dark. Now there's fast way to the right. Went to the right, went down there. And now I'm starting to get a little worried about, will I be able to find my way back out? You know, I was, I was only leaving the trail of crumbs. So on, on that, when I made that right turn in that passage, there was an indentation in the wall where I could lean up against it and somebody looking, if they were just looking down that passageway, they wouldn't be able to see me because I'd, I'd be in this indentation. So I'm there and I'm uh, uh, there. And that's the first time I think I kind of calmed down and came to the realization what was happen, happening to me mm -hmm. because I remember think that was the first time I thought of family. And I thought to myself, you know, my boys are old enough. Uh, they're uh, uh, six and five. They'd be old enough to re know, remember me if I didn't get rescued. But I had a daughter that was just turning, that same month was just turning one year old. She would have never known, known me. Mm. So I turned to my faith, said a little prayer, dear God, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, and uh, non-believers are going to say, ah, it was just coincidence. Being a believer, I thought that 
he answered my prayers because I no, no sooner said, dear God, please get me out of here. And I heard the airplanes come back again. Mm. So, so I felt like he'd answered my prayers. So I go back out. Now, luckily, when I came back out, this time when I turned on my survival radio, radio, I didn't accidentally go through that uh, position. So instead of being beeping all the time, uh, I was actual, uh, actually able to talk to, to them. And um, so, they, uh, so now uh, I'm talking to the Sandys, uh, the A1s, that uh, the Sandy was the call sign for the uh, search and rescue uh, A1s. Uh, so now uh, I'm talking to the Sandys, and uh, uh, Sandy 7 was his call sign. He took over, uh, he, uh, took over the, the search and rescue. He was in charge. So he said, uh, can you, uh, he says, give me an ADF steer. So I said, Roger. So I gave him an ADF steer. And I'm looking up, and now I'm feeling uh, raindrops that's hitting me. And I look up, and it's totally overcast. And I hear him say, I see a hole over here. He's, he tells his, his women, he says, I see a hole over here. I think I can spiral down and get underneath the stuff. He says, stand by, I'll let you know. And I think to myself, man, this guy's got some big brass ones because <laughs> I'm looking up and all I can see is this car disappearing into the clouds. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy's going to come down there and find a hard cloud, you know. And now he says, give me a steer. So I give him a steer. So he flew right over me. And as he flew right over me, I said, Sandy Seven, you just went right over me. <laughs> no acknowledgement, no no wing rock, no acknowledgement, nothing. And I thought to myself, shoot, he uh, didn't hear me. Well, reading the transcripts from the command post off the ship, uh, off of the talk, talking golf there, uh, I, I've, I was able to read that he did hear me. He was just playing it real smart. He didn't <laughs> want to give my location away, so he didn't want to rock or he didn't acknowledge just in case the guys were hearing me. So, so he is it's smart. So anyway, they um, don't like to uh, clear in the rescue chopper until they know where you are because he's got to get her in and quick and now, otherwise they get shot down. Well, this Sandy, uh, I owe my life to him because he hung it out. He said, okay, he says, uh, we have only about 30 minutes of daylight left. He says, I'm going to clear the chopper in, see if you can uh, uh, direct them by sound. And I acknowledged. So pretty soon I can hear this. And, and the one thing I had not screwed up, one thing I had done well is I'd maintained my orientation and in which way north was and all that. So I said, uh, and his call sign was uh, um, Archangel. And I said, uh, uh, Archangel, this is, I hear you. I think you're one valley south of me. Come up a valley to the north. They acknowledged. And uh, now I can hear him louder. And pretty soon I see him come up. And through this de de dense jungle, I see him go left to right, pushes him through, through the trees. And I said, I see you. I think you just flew over my chute. Do you have my chute in sight? And he goes, Roger. And I got so excited. I said, okay, I'm only 200 miles north of the chute. And he goes, you're where? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, negative, negative, 200 yards, 200 yards. So this is Roger. So pretty soon he comes over there and I'll tell you, those guys were good. Uh, they hovered right over me. They lowered the tree, tree penetrator. I only had to take two steps to reach it. So I'm Pull down the, uh, it's got, it looks like a, it comes down in a canvas bag so it's real streamlined so I can get through the trees. You unzip the bag and you fold out three pedals. You sit on one and strap your legs over the other ones mm -hmm. and then and then hook up the uh, safety lantern to have you strapped into the uh, penetration. So, so I'm on there. Well, the spring in the clasp to hook the safety clasp to hook yourself up safety. A uh, spring was either rusty or bent, but anyway, I didn't have enough strength in my thumbs 
to open the clasp completely. And every time I tried to hook it up, it would bounce off. Next thing I know, I hear through this megaphone, hurry up, let us know when we can pull you up. We're low on fuel. Man, that made me even more nervous. So now I'm trying harder to uh, hook this thing up. Couldn't do it. So anyway, meanwhile, I'm, I'm holding the radio with one hand, trying to do this with the other hand. And so after the third call, hurry up, we're low on fuel. I thought, I was going to say, okay, I'm ready. As soon as I hit okay, that's all they needed, man. They jerked me up. <laughs> I, I lost my grip on the radio, but now I got two, cap- uh, two hands to hand, hold on to the cable. So they pulled me up. I don't like high places unless I'm surrounded by metal, like uh, aircraft cockpit. So I'm going up there, I got my eyes closed, and I'm hearing squeak, squeak, squeak. And it's getting louder and louder. And I'm thinking, what the hell is that? So I look up. Well, what had happened is the helicopter had drifted. So now the cable is being instead of straight down, it's this way, draped over this branch mm-hmm. and down. So I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be interesting. I wonder how we're going to handle this. So sure enough, boom, the old branch hits me and stops me. Stops me. And the branch was about that thick. So I thought, oh, man. And I'm not strapped in, you know. So they lower me down two or three feet, pull me up a little bit faster, hit it again. Anyway, they took uh, three attempts. Finally, the third attempt, and I'm hanging on for dear life because I'm not strapped in. Finally, the third attempt, my shoulder battering ram, I broke the uh, branch and free. So now all the way up. And uh, those trees, like I said, grew to about 200 feet. So finally I clear. And meanwhile, I didn't realize how dark it had gotten in the jungle. Once I got out on top of the trees, it was dusk. You could see the sunset, you know. And uh, and once they saw they had me free of the trees, man, that old helicopter tilted the nose and started taking off, <laughs> bringing, still winching me up. Finally, I feel somebody grab the nap of my flight suit, pull me in, and uh, now we're in the chopper. Loud as can be, so loud you can't talk. And this young-looking gunner, he was just so happy to have us. And he would look at me, and he'd give me the old thumbs up. I'd give him the old thumbs back. And uh, we're going along every so often. Every time he'd look at me, he'd give me the old thumbs <laughs> up. Yep, I, I agree with you. I'm happy. And um, so then pretty soon he closes the... Uh, uh, door, uh, and we're off and running. Well, I'm thinking Air Force this whole time. And as soon as I got in the uh, chopper, first thing I did is I looked at my watch. I knew where the Air Force rescue units came from, and I knew where they were. So I thought, oh, in about 40 minutes, we'll land at Macon Phnom, the rescue base. So uh, uh, we're going along. Pretty soon, he hands me a May West to put on. And I'm thinking, just to cross the Mekong, I need a May West? So I did that. Then pretty soon he opens the, the uh, uh, door and starts throwing out anything that's not bolted in. Machine gun, ammo cans. And, and I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? And then I remember his call. Hurry up. <laughs> We're low on fuel. Mm. Anyway, he goes out there. Next time here, you know, we land. And this is a long answer to your question. Talk, talk about that picture with the bug eyes. So we land. And I jump out, and I think I'm jumping into terra firma, and instead, because I think I've been rescued by the Air Force, not realizing it was Navy, I jump out, and I get this salt spray hitting me, and these camera flashes off like that, and that's why there's that shocked look. It looks like I'm, I'm shocked from yeah. the ejection. I'm shocked because I'm on a ship. <laughs> <laughs> how did I get here, you know? <laughs> so yeah. That's how that, and, and, and anyway... Uh, when the chopper landed, it had something like five minutes left, a uh, fuel left in it. <laughs>